Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we are discussing two narratives at the end, no, sorry, one of two narratives at the end of Judges that are about Levites. I had pitched the idea to my co-hosts here of what if we combined these two stories, because they're very closely related, what if we did them in one episode? And Greg reminded me that people often don't know these stories, and so we should probably take the time to tell each one thoroughly, even though they are very closely related, and tell us one particular point about Levites in this day and age of Israel's history. Is that a fair summary of our conversation? Yeah, that'll do. Yeah. Okay, so we are in chapter 17 of Judges, is that right? That's correct. Uh, We've just dealt with Samuel, uh, sorry, not Samuel, Samson. (laughs) getting my Sams mixed up. So chronologically speaking, Samson is roughly contemporary with Samuel. Is that correct? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Sometime after Jephthah. So we're at the end of the period of the judges. Um, Eli is a judge about the time that Jephthah, Jephthah and Samson are doing their thing. It's also about the time Ruth is set. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlapping that we often miss because these stories are discrete in the Bible, they, they aren't interwoven, you know, they come in separate books. And so when we come to the end of Judges, we're inclined to think, okay, so what happens next? And it takes some reading to realize this is not what happens next. This is what happened first. Mm-hmm. And as we look at these two stories, we're going to see that these are not things that follow Jephthah and Samson, things that belong to the days of Eli and Samuel. These are things that happened in the first generation or so, right after the conquest. Because if we've, if we've made it through Judges this far, we are probably bored and annoyed at the, and they apostatized again. <laughs> and God... I feel like we've read this already. <laughs> yeah. we. What's with this cycle? No, we read this yesterday. No, yeah. we didn't. <laughs> no, it's the same thing, only worse. Uh, and, and one thing that does get worse is the years of, opp- of oppression tend to get longer the further we go in. And Israel's repentance is no longer exactly a guaranteed thing. Sometimes God just says, okay, enough of this nonsense. I'm just going to rescue them anyhow. So there, there are subtle changes as we go in, but it is an annoying cycle that the writer announced to us at the very beginning. He tells us, I think it's the second chapter, that this is the pattern you're going to see. And by the time we get here, thinking people are saying, What's with these people? Why can't they break the cycle? Why can't they transmit the faith to the next generation? One of the elders in my church many years ago now, was, I think when I, about the time I was joining the church, in fact, was, uh, was teaching Sunday school through judges. And as he taught this, he, had, he saw what we saw that this, this, in this, the whole class on this constant Things fall apart, and we start over, and things fall apart. And someone came to him and said, how does this square with your post-millennialism? And he did something he doesn't do often. He asked me. And I said, well, the, the judges aren't Jesus. And light dawn. I said, oh, of course. you know, <laughs> we're, we're seeing what happens with merely human saviors. And we're also seeing in these, these last few chapters what happens when merely human leaders don't do their job. We're looking here at the pastors, the teachers, the preachers, the people who are supposed to know the word of God and communicate with God's people. What were they doing or what weren't they doing that kept producing this generational slop? God's people will repent and they'll serve him for a generation and the next generation will fall away. Where's we want to know what's going on here. Why is this happening? Why can't they break out of the cycle? Is just is this the way that that uh, true religion works? It never survives more than a generation, and you have to wait for a great revival before it comes up again, or is there something else going on here? And so the author has put these two stories at the end, these two historical accounts. They're both about Levites and. The Levites are mostly unnamed. One is completely unnamed. The other is named only at the very end of his story. And there it's quite a revelation. Mm-hmm. But he, the, the writer doesn't hesitate to, hesitate to just say, a Levite. You know, this is like if someone were to say, well, well, there was this Presbyterian. 
There was this Republican. <laughs> there was this... This Irishman who walked into a bar. Exactly. You know, that. And we, we, we all jump and say that's stereotyping. Except when God does it, it's not stereotyping. It's very akin to what Jesus does when he says, there was this Pharisee. Mm-hmm. And remember on one occasion, one of the lawyers says, hey, master, when you say that, you're indicting the lawyers too. He says, what are you lawyers? Um, <laughs> he, Jesus did not apologize for making sweeping generalizations when they were true. And, and, and for them to be true doesn't require them to be true of each individual in that group necessarily. Not a generalization can be true on a general level, a which general is what it's level. designed to do. <laughs> and, and I have some, is, some friends who reject generalizations on principle, and I, yeah, I think that's well, dangerous. That's, <laughs> do, do they generally wreck anyway? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Only anyway. generally. Only generally. So we have these two stories. And they both tell us something about the way the Levites, these particular Levites and and presumably Levites in general were acting. And and it's it's fleshed out when we get to Samuel, the next book, because we see that not only were these particular Levites who were the common pastors of the villages and, and towns about Israel, but the priests too were doing exactly the same thing, only worse, which uh, ends up in the loss of the ark, the priest committing abomination before the Lord, the desolation of his of his tabernacle, uh, and eventually the shift to the Davidic covenant. So the these are not just random stories of, well, who are these random people and why are they doing these random things and why it's so important? It's important because it answers the question of what's going on here? What's wrong? So with that as a background, as we look at chapter 17, there's a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. Now, we've had trouble with Ephraimites before. They are descended from Joseph, Joseph's second-born, but elevated to the status of first-born. They kind of got a chip on their shoulders. But Are they the ones that are always not showing up to battle and then being like, why didn't you call us? We wanted the glory of battle. Yeah, that's exactly who it okay. is. Well, this guy's, it doesn't say a whole lot about that, but it does. It goes out of the way to mention a couple times that this is from Mount Ephraim. His name is Micah, who is shortened of Michael, who was like God. Interesting name. And we, we, we're, we're, we come in in the middle of the action. He said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and speak also in mine ears. Okay, so mom had a lot of silver, 1,100 pieces. And she and someone had taken it from her, someone stole it. And she had uttered a curse. This is not. A modern American curse where we just use <laughs> She bad wasn't just language. swearing because she was mad that she'd lost it. <laughs> yeah. This, this, she is uttering a religious sanction against the th- against the thief. She's calling down the wrath of God on the thief. Well, Micah is a very superstitious kind of individual. And having heard this, he is now afraid of the curse, and so he's confessing. The silver, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. So she undoes the curse. Okay, well, that's kind of odd and weird. And where is this going? And what's that all about? Yeah, what lets her just undo a curse that she did? Yeah, it's... um, hmm. It's it's like when I ask my my seventh grade math students, I'm like, "So, so we have to isolate the variable... And so they're like, right, so we divide it by three. And I'm like, what lets you divide it by three? Like, who gave you the right? <laughs> you have to do it to both sides of the equation. Sorry, continue. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of arbitrariness and, again, superstition. The, the, their religion op- operates by folk rules that they, they seem to know. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord to Yahweh, from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. See, son, the reason I was so worked up about this in order and brought God in is because this silver was designed to go wholly to the Lord, to Jehovah, to make two idols, one graven, one molten, mm-hmm. or perhaps a graven one that's all, a molten one that's also going to be graven. Anyway, an idol of some sort. What? <laughs> You dedicated to God so that your son could have, could make an idol for you to worship. And that's why you were so upset and called God in to back you up. But the son doesn't blink at that. 
he says, um, or he he gives it back. Uh, well, she tries to give it back to him, but she, he gives it back to her. It's like it's it's this hot potato. You take it. No, you take it. I don't want it. I, it's hot. It's got. I stole it. It's got God's wrath on it. Oh, okay. Eventually, though. His mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a founder who made a graven image and a molten image. Remember that $1,100 that she had wholly dedicated to the Lord? Only 200 of it made it into the idol. So much for dedicating it wholly to the Lord. <laughs> she kind of had a change of heart, it seems, and kept some of it. Most of it, but, you know, given what she wants it for. Mm. They can't even do idolatry, right? Yeah, they even cheat the gods, cheat the false gods. The man Micah, well, the founder makes the images. They're in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod that's a priestly garment. And teraphim, those are little household, tiny gods. Think of uh, the images of saints that some people have on their mantles or little Buddhas and such, those kind of things. The little gods who help out the big gods. And um, he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest in the name of Jehovah. Well, Jehovah that's, has priests and they're Levites. Yeah, that that's isn't part of the part of the system. Yeah, this is this is holy, unholy. Um, he's making innovative. it up as he goes. Innovative. He's making it up as he goes, and yet he and his mom are absolutely convinced that they are doing God's service. Uh, we should already, this in itself is suspicious. Has no one explained to them the first and second commandments? Are they that ignorant? Well, anyway, and then the writer drops in something that becomes a refrain, mostly in, in this last part of the book. But in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And some have read that as, oh, see, you need political centralized authority. Not what it's mm -hmm. saying. It's saying Jehovah is supposed to be your king. And he's not. You're all doing whatever you please. And here is a great example of that, or that example, depending on how you look at it. Okay, what does it have to do with Levites? There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. So he lived in the territory of Judah, may have been married into it, or maybe his mom was, uh, was Judah. But he stands in the true line of Levi. He's a legitimate Levite. And he's, he's hanging out there, Bethlehem, Judah. Yes, the city where Jesus will be born. Both of these stories involve Bethlehem, Judah. Uh, and that's interesting because Bethlehem does not come off well here. It's supposed to be the house of bread. That's what the name means. And here's a pastor from the house of bread. Wouldn't you think he'd have bread for God's people? But not so much. Uh, verse 8, the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place, and he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he sojourned. Again, this is a little iffy. Now, in America, we're not completely surprised when a new pastor just shows up out of the blue and shops his talents around and says, hey, anybody need a pastor? Or we, we would hope, actually, that maybe he might try to start a new work. And and that's, in Israel, Levites were assigned. <laughs> I mean, there was there was some, some degree of communication and agreement as to who was where. You didn't just pull up stakes and leave a town without a pastor and go someplace and present yourself as a pastor because you could be one and they may or may not have one and they may or may not hire you. It's, again, it's a really flaky kind of, kind of approach. But he comes looking for work. And he meets Micah. Micah says, whence comest thou? Where are you from? I'm a Levi from Bethlehem, Judah. I go to sojourn where I might find a place. I'm looking for work. I'm a pastor. I'm looking for work. Micah said, dwell with me and be unto me a father, in the spiritual sense, and a priest. Now, he's a Levite. He's not a priest. But you can, you can be a priest. You're close enough. And I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel, probably his, what do you call vestments? And your riddles, your food. That's not a lot. This is not like I'll give you a million dollars in a Learjet. This is enough to get by on, but it's not a whole lot. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite. He has no authority to consecrate anybody to do anything. <laughs> and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. 
Then Micah said, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. This reminds me of Huckleberry Finn, where mm. he's got all of these different superstitions. Yes. And everybody's got a different superstition. And he, you know, according to one of these ways of thinking, he's he's gotten some bad luck. Yeah. But he's like, but I know the widow was praying for me, so maybe that'll work out to be good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it puts it all on the same level. Yeah. It's, it's all... Ways the universe randomly works, and there's good magic and there's bad magic, good luck and bad luck. And yeah, I, I want to be on God's side. I'm sure God would like this and that, maybe some of this. And I'm sure this, this, you think that would offend God? I don't think so. I think he'd be fine with that. If I were God, I'd be fine with that. Uh, the level of superstition and, and religious and moral ignorance is incredible at this point. And what we should note is the Levite isn't helping any. He's supposed to be a teacher of God's word, but what is he doing? He's selling out for room and board, basically. It's it, it's not a lot of money. You know, we, we, we kind of get it when someone gets into, say, a television ministry, a radio ministry or something, or some huge kind of ministry project, and the money starts rolling in, and the opportunities abound, and you can make appearances before international audiences, and everyone knows your name, and we... We can see how that might tempt people to follow the money and and tone down the message, uh, pretending they're doing God's service by making it more user-friendly. This guy's not getting much of anything. If he just go out and get a day job, he probably would have done better. Uh, certainly morally, he would have done infinitely better. But there you go. And, and as we go to chapter 18, we get the refrain again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. He, he taught, Micah talks about the Lord doing him good, but the Lord is not his king, nor is the Lord the king of this Levite. This Levite is autonomous. He's doing his own thing in the religious realm to make a quick buck and, and uh, what, were, what were Schaefer's was personal peace and affluence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the levels of both don't have to be very high for people to sell the gospel. Well, now we come to the Danites. Let's let's include many tribes here so we can see how wide-ranging this, this kind of thing is. The One of the things, one of the ways whereby we know that this is an early story is because it's told way back in the tales of the original conquest when Joshua was still alive. So we're going back to the beginning here. Uh, the children of Dan are, have received their inheritance like everybody else. But they find out that the uh, Canaanites who are in their valleys are just too strong for them. And they don't want to go down and fight them. So instead of that, they send out a scouting expedition to find some other place that would be easier to conquer and would be nice and safe and, and, and cozy and all that. And so they, they send out uh, of their family five men of their coast, men of valor, and they are go they send to spy out and see what they can find. And along the way, they pass through Mount Ephraim and they find Micah. And they they don't know Micah, but they they've heard of the Levite. They they actually know the Levite. They recognize his voice. So this Levite's been getting around. And they, oh, well, what are you doing here? What what brought you here? And what 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 do you what's what's your gig? And um, what what do you got going on? And, well, what's this? And here's the thing. And Micah's made me his priest, and he's hired. He has hired me. He says, <laughs> hired pastors, not good. And so, oh, so you're you're doing the pastor thing. Will you inquire of God for us? Whether or not we will be successful in our venture? Oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, yes, go in peace before the Lord is your way. That'll be 10 bucks. Um, and, and so the men go on and they go up to the northern boundaries of the promised land beyond that, which God actually a lot of them, just a little bit ways over the border. And they find a town called Laish that's far from everywhere. And they don't really have much in the way of a constable. Or there's no magistrate in the land there's no police department, no judges. They don't have any business with anybody. They're, they're, they're Canaanites. They're, they're compared to the Zionians, but they don't really have any business even with them. They're just out there in the middle of nowhere doing their own thing, laid back, and and their land looks nice. And so these Danites say, wow, we could we could conquer this really easily. No one will help them, and they're, they're not ready for an attack. They say, arise that we may go. They go back and tell 
uh, the tribe of Dan what they found. And they they tell them, yeah, this this is great. Don't be slothful. Let's let's go possess the land. Uh, for God hath given it into your hands. Uh huh. <laughs> he'd already given them a land. He'd, he'd, he'd given them a land. They just didn't want the hard work of taking it. Well, some of the tribe of Dan, not all of it, because you know that some of it stays where it is, and that's where Samson comes from. But some of these people just don't want to fight the battles of the Lord, so they're going to go out and fight their own little private war. Uh, they send out 600 men armed, and along the way, um, they they come back to the house of Micah. And the five men who had been the original spies say to the rest of them, do you know that there is in these houses an ephod? And remember, ephod is not only the priestly garment. Remember the story of Gideon has... The original ephod came with the Urim and Thummim, which allowed the wearer to get yes and no answers from God. No doubt this thing had, you know, something similar, not divine, but faked black and white stones or something, dice you could toss, some, something. So, you know, it's basically, we have a Ouija board and we have teraphim, we have our little household gods and a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, consider what you have to do. Now, any place else in the Bible, consider what you have to do would be, these are idolaters and these are idols. What do you have to do? Destroy them. Destroy them. Easy peasy. Um, not, not, this requires no mental effort and very little spiritual effort to at least decide, well, yeah, these are false gods and God said they should be eliminated. Where are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. But at least that, they, they should all say, you mm -hmm. should really do something about this. Consider what you have to do. And they turned in thither. They came to the house of the young man, the Levite, um, saluted him. And the 600 stood by the gate, guarding it so that no one interferes. And the five men come in and, and they take the image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest is there. And the priest says, what are you doing? And they say, shut up. Put your hand on your mouth. You come with us. We're kidnapping you. <laughs> Is it better for you to be a father and a priest to a whole tribe or just to one man? Hmm. I get benefits and a bonus? Yeah, I like that. Cool. I'm with you guys. Let me get my hat. And so he's ready to eat. Micah, who treated him like a son, he's ready to abandon because now there are more financial assets and influence and, and all that available because now he's going to be a priest, air quotes, for an entire tribe. Mm. Well, they start off. Micah eventually f comes home or finds out what's going on. And he and a, and a bunch of his household and friends go out and cry after them. Now, there's, there's a little bit of humor here. We're told in verse 21, as the Danites are leaving, they put their children and the cattle and all of that in front so, if you looked at this from a distance and you saw them going to battle, all the big strong men are in the back and all the children are leading the way. But and that's supposed to be a joke. But the, the practical reason is they know that the danger is going to come from the back. What if Mike and his friends decide to try to take it all back? Well, Micah considers it, but uh, they cried to the children of Dan. They turned their faces and said to Micah, what aileth thee to come with such a company? You've taken away my gods, which I made. <laughs> Insert Augustine city of God right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Taken away the gods I've made. Yeah, well, maybe. Mm. Uh, yeah, Augustine, because no one says it better. And and my priest, and you're gone away. And what have I more? This was my whole religion, my whole heart, my whole life. And now you say, what aileth thee? And the children of dead do sort of this whisper, hey, but. Let not thy, verse, thy voice be heard amongst us, lest angry fellows run upon thee, and thou lose thy life, and the life of thy household. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Realizing he can do nothing, he turns around and goes back. And that's the last we hear of him. And you think the story's over, but it's, it's, there's a little bit left. So, the Danites go up to Laish. They conquer it, burn it, take it over. There's no deliver, no one to help them. And they build a city and they call it Dan. And throughout the rest of the Old Testament, when we want to describe the entire extent of the promised land, we will say from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba. Dan is the northern extremity, Beersheba is the southern, Beersheba is in Judah. 
So they name it after their father. And then these last two verses. The children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, first of all, we get the priest's name. We're going to talk about that in a second. But they set this shrine up over against Jehovah's shrine at the tabernacle, which at that time was in Shiloh. And it becomes the official state religion of the tribe of Dan, this worship of this image. And again, they say they're worshiping Jehovah, but they're worshiping them under, under the form of an idol. Uh, they have their own priest who was not authorized by Jehovah. He's, he is a Levite, but he is not of the Aaronic family. He has no business offering sacrifices or doing anything in any way. It's not even Jehovah. It's an idol. It's a rock. It's a piece of stone. It's whatever it was. And it's there until the day of the captivity of the land. The question becomes, which captivity? It may mean, because we're contrasting it with Shiloh in the next verse, it may mean when the Philistines took over everything, if they if their reach was that great, uh, which would still be about 100 years or so. If it means the captivity of the land, if this was written by, put inserted by a later editor under divine inspiration, then it could mean that this, this cult thing went on all the way to the Assyrians carried the northern kingdom captive. In favor of that is that when Jeroboam I wanted to set up his, uh, his fake gods, the golden calves, he put one in Bethel and he put the other in Dath. Mm -hmm. And this is it. Whether if this was still standing at that time, then it got added in or assimilated. If it had already been destroyed, it was still a fresh breeding ground for more idolatry. Now, as far as the tribe of Dan goes, yes, we have the one bright light, Samson. But by the time we're done and we get to the book of Revelation and God lists the 12 tribes of Israel, two tribes are missing. God does some creative juggling. He reinserts Levi, who's often not recognized among the list because Levi didn't have any um, established territory. And he brings back Joseph and sets him beside Manasseh. And he eliminates two tribes, Dan and Ephraim. Dan, mm -hmm. who began idolatry here, Ephraim, who continued it after all their opposition to the judges. And Ephraim is the tribe of Jeroboam who set up the idols at Dan and Bethel. Bethel was in Ephraim. So this is a thing with a long, long shadow. They set them up, Micah's graven image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Micah's graven image. How do you want to be the how much do you want to be the guy whose name goes down in eternal history as they worshiped Micah's idol for decades? Not, you'll be remembered forever. You'll be remembered forever as the guy <laughs> in, who, in your superstitious ignorance, made an idol and it became the thing that seduced an entire tribe or whereby they seduced themselves and gave way to their, their spiritual lusts. There's one last thing. We got the name and the name is deliberately saved till the end. And at first glance, it doesn't seem, okay, so Jonathan, uh, gift of Jehovah. Gershom, stranger in a strange land, that should ring a bell. Mm -hmm. Son of Manasseh. Okay, well, we've, we, there, there was a Manasseh who's the son of Joseph, and there are later Manassehs in Scripture. But there's something that, weird that happens in the Hebrew text at this point. Uh, the, uh, the Masoretes have inserted, uh, or they copied in, the letter in, but it hangs above the consonantal text. You know the way we use a carrot and write a number, or write a, a letter up above to say this ball, this goes here. Mm -hmm. That's how this is. The the N is not in line with the other consonants. It's inserted above, with as 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 if to say, include this when you pronounce it. If you don't include it, though, you get a different name. Mm. The name you get is Moses, who had a son named Gershom. Who had a son named Gershom. In other words, here's the big reveal. This Levite 
Moses' grandson. Is Moses' grandson. Hmm. Wow. Oh, my. That's no blame on Moses, but it says an awful lot about his grandson. He knew. He'd heard. He'd been there. And he didn't care. He was going to take his cheap religious heritage. He valued it cheaply. And he was going to parlay it into, well, bread and board. Or bread board. Bed and board. <laughs> oh, oh, and I can do even more with it. I can become a religious leader for an entire obscure part of a tribe. Okay, that sounds good. And it's going to be a snare to the entire nation and get my entire tribes or this tribe's name eliminated from the role of God's people. But, you know, I got my steak on Friday, so I'm good. This is what was going... And again, the point is, although this was a special case, we do get this guy's name. Um, the emphasis throughout has been, he's a Levite. And we're to say, this is what the Levites were like? Yeah. Because when we get to Samuel, this is what the priests are like. Hophni and Phinehas, they're not teaching the law of God. They're not being faithful to worship. They're defiling worship. They're raping the nuns, the maidens, who gathered before the tabernacle. They're making God's worship abominable. And when God's people create abomination before him, he brings in Gentile armies to desolate the sanctuary. And so this is this is a direct line into Samuel, and it prepares us for what's coming. And it shows us what's going on. Now, stepping back, as we look at our own age and our own nation in particular, but probably it's a rather universal phenomena. You're both a bit younger than I am. I don't know how well you remember, but back in the, I guess it would have been the 80s now or so, how many major television ministries fell apart when not not simply because they were fe- preaching false doctrine, but because of the lewd, lascivious character of the preachers. It came mm-hmm. out in the open. We found out that these people, these men's concern was not preaching the gospel. In fact, much of which they preached was health and wealth. And I believe you've both seen the um, two current videos whose names went right out of my head. <laughs> American Gospel. American Gospel. Yeah. Um, I, well, I was thinking too of the um, news that came out not too long ago about the about um, Ravi Zacharias. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. You know, we're, we're saddened, especially mm-hmm. when it's someone who seems to have actually stood for the faith. Mm-hmm. The guys back in the seventies and eighties, not so much. Uh, oh, oh, they did some good, no doubt, but there was a lot of moralism, a lot of legalism, a lot of. Um, flash and show and charisma, but to call people to take up their crosses and follow Jesus uh, was not exactly high on, on their agenda. Their doctrines were not pure. They, they were not confessional. They were not creedal. And they pretty well played to their audience. What will make us popular? What will bring in the bucks? Um, and American churches continue along this line, user-friendly. What will bring people in? What will make people happy? What will get us a, a bigger community? Now, in the beginning, and you, you probably both remember something of the whole seeker-friendly trend, mm-hmm. which is not completely dead, but it suffered a bit. Um, the argument was always, well, you can't preach to them unless they're here. So we're going to be friendly and get them in. And people who think they're interested about religion, they, they may not have a clue what it's all about. Well, we'll get them in. We'll be nice to them. We'll love on them. And, and and then we can tell them the truth. But that will scare them away, and then they won't be here anymore, and then you can't <laughs> preach to them anymore. And and that became the great um, catch-22. Well, they're here. We should, well, now we can start telling them, well, but if we start talking about sin and challenging them in their, about their sins, then they're going to go away, and we won't be able to minister to them. We need to just work it a little more slowly. And month by month, year by year, decade by decade. Delegate to the small groups. It's, yeah, somewhere in the small groups, they'll get it. Except the small group leaders aren't getting it. It's not showing up in your regular service. It's not show up, showing up in your pastor's preaching. The thought was somebody somewhere at some point is surely going to share the gospel with them. We'll get them here and our people somehow will do this good work at some level, we hope. But don't offend them. Don't We don't want to lose them. And that coupled with the modern American idea that love means total acceptance and never critiquing and criticizing anybody 
led to more and more churches glutted with not even nominal Christians, blatant unbelievers, who simply found that Christians are nice people to hang out with them when they buy them Starbucks and sing some cool songs that sound an awful lot like what's in the top 40, except they have <laughs> these weird religious words I'm not sure about. But, you know, that's the, the music's got a good beat. And the, the entertainment level's high. A lot of good light shows and smoke. And, and the gospel's lost. Mm. And you want to know how to derail the kingdom of God in your generation? Stop teaching the truth. But the truth is divisive and offensive. Yeah, and it always has been. Nothing new. The Reformation did not come because people tried to make, because Protestants wanted to make the Roman Catholics feel comfortable. <laughs> Jesus said, I came not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword. Yeah. Just said, father against mother, husband against wife, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. The gospel is an offensive thing. Now, that doesn't mean we have to be jerks and make it more offensive. <laughs> right. And some people do that, but that's yeah. that's um, in some ways a minimal problem uh, until you try to craft your your whole religious denomination along those lines. <laughs> and there are some who've done that. Yes. Our entire denomination is devoted to the idea that we will not to talk to anybody until they have good haircuts, smell nice, and work at good jobs, and don't use bad language, and don't listen to rock and roll. Then we can win them to Christ. Uh, side story. <laughs> Uh, my previous church, years and years ago, uh, we were without a pastor for a while. I was doing some of the pulpit supply, and there was, but there was another man who was doing it too, and he had been preaching multiple sermons on how we ought to be evangelistic. Good for him. And then it came my turn to fill the pool. I said, "Okay, I want to show you how Jesus evangelized, and who he evangelized." Oh wow! Because <laughs> woman at the well. Uh, the woman who washed Jesus' feet, the first one, the sinner, uh, Matthew and his friends. I just went down the list of who Jesus evangelized. And when I left, I got some rather rude comments that amounted to, so I guess we can all hang out with whores, right? One, one, one gentleman who at one time had been a pastor in another denomination said, well, I guess I can renew my subscription to Playboy. I had no idea what he even meant. Like, huh? Yeah, huh? No? What are you talking about? It took me a long while to figure out, oh, you belong to one of those denominations that thinks that you are so holy that you can't even sit in the same room with someone who's a sinner or you're compromised. Well, guess what? So on the other hand, that was also, that was a sermon or message after which I got more encouragement from people who never talked to me. People mm -hmm. stopped me in a random place and said, that was what we needed to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that was encouraging. It reminds me of a conversation I was having with David recently. We were just chatting as, you know, tend to chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the difference between media and interactions with people. You know, there's lots of people on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube for the purpose of being a Christian presence in those places. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, nothing against being on Twitter, or Instagram, or YouTube. You know, there's lots of good reasons to be there. But I was thinking, you know, how long is it before someone says, well, I need to be a Christian presence on OnlyFans or a worse website? Hmm. Um, and that's... That's not what Jesus did. He didn't set up shop in the red light district. <laughs> he met the people and he yeah. ministered to the people. Mm -hmm. That requires interacting with them. That doesn't require engaging in their platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to go to the red light district and get a street corner and start denouncing prostitution and particularly the men who use the prostitutes and start putting them out by name, mm -hmm. that might be acceptable. But going there and, you know, bringing you the prostitutes tea, um, or let alone their customers, uh, is is not, no, it's not what Jesus did. As you say, he ministered to people who were sinners, like we all are. But this, this Levite that we're looking at here, he was in it for the money, plain and simple. And again, I keep saying, it wasn't much money. It doesn't, you don't have to surrender a whole lot for a whole lot to betray the kingdom of Christ. 
question is, what are your motives? What are you in this for? What is, are you going to stand for the truth? You talked about going on some platform as a Christian presence. Fine. Christian presence means you are, with love, going to tell the truth that's relevant to that situation. Do you know that that doctrine is humanistic, self-centered, unloving, and an attack on women, Jews, black people, white people? Call it like it is. You want to, you don't, you, oh, but that'll start controversy. Yep, sure will. That's what a, being a Christian. Remember John the Baptist before Herod? <laughs> he was yep. a Christian presence in the, in the very courtroom, <laughs> and the throne room. And yeah, I got him in jail, got him beheaded eventually. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's understand what Christian presence means. It doesn't mean you just hang around in, in emote Christian waves. <laughs> did, did you feel the Christian vibes in this room? Send out the good vibes. Yeah. You actually have to speak the truth. And again, in love. But love does not mean total acceptance. It means you're seeking the spiritual well-being of the person, right? Yeah. Um, just also bringing in something else I've been thinking about. Um, it, it's interesting. This is just etymological uh, notice that at first here is that we call it simony after mm-hmm. Simon in the book of Acts, and we don't call it Mycony. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it just sounds better as simony. Um, but then also, uh, there's been an interesting byline. I am a Christian presence on Twitter, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't make it like my, my full-time job, obviously. But um, <laughs> it's been interesting. There's been a, a particular byline uh, that I've seen argued that I, I I think I mostly at least agree with in principle, and it's you know you're you're setting yourself up on Twitter as a uh, theologically conservative voice mm-hmm. to to speak out against you know modernism modernism liberalism feminism whatever it is that your particular niche is is yeah. designed to be on the platform, and that's great. I mean if you're doing that. It's great. I also think if you can make money while doing that, that's also great. The mm-hmm. thing that has been really weird, and this is the byline that's been I've seen argued from other people, is putting your Patreon link in your bio on Twitter. <laughs> okay, and you it have to just explain. hits yeah. me wrong. Okay. You have to so explain Patreon that to me. is a website where people can subscribe to you to support what you're doing, and they get some perks. Like if you really like a podcast, and they have a Patreon. Um, I can use that example because we don't, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, they can, you can set up different tiers for people to support you at different levels and you get more perks the more you support them. And you pay it's five kind bucks of, a month yeah. to support them and so that they get money from the things that they're, they're doing for mm-hmm. their, you know, community or whatever that they've yeah. developed that follow okay. them. So it's kind of a return to the ideal of artistic patronage, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah. varying so, degrees of success. It, it it's a great idea if you're like especially for 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 things that are more actually commodity like if you're watching someone teach you how to cook random kinds of food on youtube and you're like this guy gets 30 cents a year from youtube uh putting ads on his videos so you know i'll go support that so he can can continue getting paid to do this thing that i am benefiting from right but i also think it's a little weird when you end up doing that in a theological sense because it it doesn't always have to end up being simonistic but right. it definitely is that is the danger with yeah. that because eventually your bottom line your income your motivation for saying or doing or confronting things is determined by demos by right. democracy, by who is paying you. Right. And I don't mean to disparage anyone, but here goes. <laughs> 90% of people are stupid. <laughs> and I'm in the 90%. Don't think this is elitist. <laughs> um, and, and so just hearing this, I, I, that, that, that's just the modern example that I could think of. But throughout this whole story, I'm just thinking – Simony. It's it's a hundred percent the through line of this story where money, uh, mammon, is someone's motivation for breaking the commands of Yahweh, right? And for 
I mean, we, we see it in, in the first story with uh, the son who, who, oh, thank you, mother, the, this, this, this metal, 1,700 pieces to, to Yahweh for me to build an idol. <laughs> and he puts 200 towards it and he <laughs> presumably pockets the rest or uses part of it to pay a, a metal smith and pockets the rest of that. There's no honor in that. There's no, no. truthfulness. There's no justice. It is purely money mm-hmm. being the driving motivator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you said um, to break the commandments of Yahweh, and I would add one thing, in the name of Yahweh. Mm-hmm. Which is even worse. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I am, I, I'm going to break the, I'm going to take money to break God's commands, to break Jesus' commands, and I'll do it all in the name of Jesus. And that well, we makes can- it better. I can think too of uh, individuals who I remember seeing someone like this back when I was uh, a member of the Reform Pub. Where, <laughs> sorry, it was that it happened there. <laughs> um, where, to their credit, the admins, all of the admins that were there, were all arguing with this guy and saying that that no, don't even like consider this as an option. But the individual was basically saying, abortion is so evil that I will throw away my life to bomb a clinic and take out the people who are murdering innocent children. So you're going to murder people to stop murder. That's doing <laughs> wrong in the name of rights. And it doesn't work that way when you're not a duly like appointed minister of God's justice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sign on. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why this story's here because mm-hmm. it's it's you know we, we stand by, and I, I love the fact that you called it simony because I didn't even I've never actually used that word when telling a story and yet of course that's exactly what it is and yeah the question why isn't it called Mikey <laughs> you know, but it is one of the traditional dangers and vices uh, of the ministry will you sell out the truth for I like your word mammon. Um, whatever form it takes for you. And if you do, then the next generation isn't going to know the truth. They're going to know what's convenient and that feels warm and good and soft and cozy and familiar. And as in our generation, God will more and more become your friend, your pal, your divine psychotherapist, your your holistic uh, <laughs> medicinal practitioner. You know, he's going to put your life back together for you, but there's no discussion of sin of guilt, of atonement, of justification. It all just becomes what what can God what can your God offer me for ninety five ninety nine? Because that's about what I'm willing to spend on this. Well for that, but for just a few bucks more, you can get yeah. Well next week we'll see the other thing mm-hmm. that caused the transmission gap, the generation gap. That echoes through the book of Judges. Yeah. And that's not a happy story either. No, it's not. And children yeah. are off. That's in the Bible. Yeah, I'm sorry. Your parents yeah. didn't read it to you or no, your Sunday school teachers, apparently. But yeah. So hang on, kids. You get to hear a real fun <laughs> story next time. <laughs> Yay. All right. Um, let's let's find <laughs> some good things to talk about. Do you guys have any recommendations? <laughs> Brian. Yes, I have a book on the how tos of simony. It's called. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please no, please no. <laughs> Sorry, I read a book this past week because with uh, the lead up to the wedding and getting settled as a married person, I have I have had very little time for that, uh, and I finally got to finish a book which I really really enjoyed, and it's called. The Buried, the Buried Giant by mm. Katsuo Ishiguro, which despite his name, he's actually English. And his <laughs> parents were um, immigrants there. But it's a very interesting, slower paced novel. And it, I think the best exemplification of how slow the pace is, is that the main characters are an elderly Briton couple, both like in their 60s, who are traveling along the roads to visit their son's village. And it's great. It's <laughs> it's like uh it's it's in sub Roman Britain and shortly after the days of Arthur, um the kind of main plot MacGuffin is 
a mysterious mist spreading over the lands that is making everyone just forget things. Mm. Little things, big things, it doesn't matter. They all seem a little bit forgetful. Anyway, it's very good. Um, it, if you're expecting it to tie in to any recognized... Um, I can't Mythology. think of the term for it, Mythology? but orthodox oh. Arthurian legend. <laughs> um, you're not going to get that, but it is very good. And if you can understand that it's going to be slow and more philosophical uh, in its uh, ending and you know application and stuff, then I think you might enjoy it. So, Buried Giant, Kazuo Ishiguro. Cool, cool. I'm also going to recommend a book that I finally had time to read. And that is The Velveteen Rabbit. It's not as sophisticated as Brian's recommendation, maybe. Um, but if you haven't read it in a while, kind of vaguely remember, there's something about being real and a rabbit and a skin horse. And that's weird. Why do you have a skin horse in your nursery? What is a skin horse? <laughs> and whose skin is it? Yeah, yeah. All these questions. I, I have so many questions. Um, Enough questions. <laughs> but we, we reread this book. It was... Uh, given as a baby gift to us. And so we've had the opportunity to review some of our childhood favorites and some some new books that have been given to our unborn child that we are excited to share with her when she arrives. Um, but this one was one of those given to us, and we thought, this is t it's time to read this again. And it's it's delightful, and it's profound, and it's... I thought it was going to take a turn. I hadn't read it since I was very small. And uh, something happened in the story, and I was like, oh, no, I, I see where this is going. <laughs> and it did not go that way. Oh, and it, okay. the, the story was better for not going that way. So mm. um, that's, that's, no, that's the no spoiler Emily review. Um, yeah, The Velveteen Rabbit. Velveteen Rabbit. <sighs> well, I told Brian and Emily earlier that the only books I, I'd actually been reading again, which is fun. Um, but they were all books I've read before, and unfortunately, they were, I think there were four of them, they were all about UFOs, which <laughs> two of them by, by Christian authors. Um, and it's an interesting, fascinating field, but I don't recommend it as a study for anyone, unless you find yourself on the fringes of that weird world on occasion. So I'm going to go in a completely different direction, and uh, I'm going to recommend Christmas music. Hmm. Uh, in the classroom, I have this computer that has access to my music and, well, YouTube, and thus the music <laughs> of the world. And my daughter today tapped Pandora, and it came up with, uh, I think it was Pandora, it came up with a playlist that called, was called Christmas for Old People. <laughs> this sounds like my playlist. <laughs> uh, I was not surprised to find Dean Martin, Perry Como, and Frank Sinatra on there. I was a little <laughs> surprised to find the Eagles on there. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and as my, my girls have been playing Christmas music, I, I find myself listening to it, you know, walking in in the middle of a song. I think, oh, that's very pleasant. That's a good rendition. And asking who did it. And it's some rocker out of my generation <laughs> who never did anything normal or nice. And yet here, Christmas brings something good out. But in recommending Christmas music, I want to recommend both Christmas music, which to my mind is music that is deliberately evangelical and worshipful. That is, it's Bible-centered. It preaches the gospel. Uh, and there are some Christmas carols that don't. They borderline on Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. I will not offend everybody or lose reader listeners by telling you which ones. <laughs> yeah, um, I versus... have some opinions on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's one thing. And, 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 and we don't want to diminish those. Certainly, the more those are heard in public, even if they're being used to manipulate people into buying more junk at Walmart, still, if people hear the gospel, that, that that's not in and of itself a bad thing. But I also want to stand up for holiday songs. And by holiday songs, I mean songs that celebrate ordinary life in the midst of Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year mm -hmm. holidays. Seasons. There's nothing wrong with these songs, mm -hmm. uh, at least in, as a general category. They say something about an America that, by and large, we've lost. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that sense, they're a tribute to the Christian heritage when people self-consciously celebrated Christmas without apologizing, without fear of offending somebody, and, and acknowledge, even if their songs are not specifically about Christian traditions, the Christian message, 
it is most clearly a Christmas hol a Christian holiday they're talking about. And they do so with a good deal of nostalgia, a good deal of emphasis upon family. And it's a Christmas, what is it? Party at the home of Farmer, Farmer Gray. Gray. Yeah, that It'll is exactly the song I was thinking of. of perfect <laughs> day. day. Yeah, and it goes on and just describes what it used to be like when family got together to celebrate holidays. Mm -hmm. And I it's think nice that's thing. also a valid thing. It's something mm -hmm. to remember what we've lost. And there's also a lot of good uh, trivia for the holidays you can you can pull out of those. <laughs> yeah. uh, what was the I'm, name of the horse in Jingle well, Bells? <laughs> yeah. And um, I met a man from Tennessee and he was going, where was it? For what? Oh, yeah. Pennsylvania. <laughs> and? and Homemade pumpkin pie. There you go. See? This this is part of our cultural heritage. And it's a shame to lose it on the younger generation. I don't know how many times I've heard my students talk about grandma being run over by reindeer. <laughs> That's about as broad as their cultural non-church Christmas traditions go. And it's really pretty disgusting. But if we don't stop and share the music and explain what this meant and why it was important, how it recorded the sentiments and feelings of earlier generations, I think we do them in a service. No, it's not a replacement for true faith in Christ by any means, but it is uh, an overflow and an outpouring, a common grace, if you will, of what effect Christ coming into the world has had. Even people who don't believe in him once a year stopped and did homage to him, even some of these Hollywood stars and Broadway greats who, who themselves, their lives were a moral mess, calmed down themselves and sang tributes to the King of Kings. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's okay to encourage people to listen to that. Although I still have trouble listening to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir singing any Christmas hymn or anything, <laughs> whatever, yeah. because I'm not sure what God they're singing to. But you know, well, that's, especially that's when they thing. slightly change a lyric and you go like, why did they change that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A perfect example of what you're talking about, I think, is the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, mm. They have some musically fantastic Christmas albums. Um, sort of rock opera style. Yeah. And it's super fun music. I love to play it. I got some of the piano songbooks and they draw on a lot of, you know, classical sources. So you get rock versions of uh, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker and things like that. But they are self consciously creating Christmas myths that are secularizing Christmas Ooh. on purpose. And. Mm. I like that I'm aware that that's what they're doing so that I can enjoy their music and then think, yes, this is not for church. Um, so anyway. I, I remember that. listening to one of Inya's Christmas mm -hmm. um, CDs and it was beautiful. Of course, a lot of it was Celtic because I didn't understand a thing they were Gaelic they were saying, <laughs> they were saying. But I did notice that at one point uh, in What Child Is This, uh, it went to the lyrics were shifted just subtly. Raise, raise the song on high. Mary sings her lullaby. Mm. And it took me a long time to realize, wait, why aren't they saying the virgin? Oh, that mm -hmm. would be acknowledging the virgin birth. And well, the, uh, that's, the, uh, there's, another, there's another group that does that too. And I can't remember the, the hymn, the carol that they take. But um, Bastille, in, in the opening of one of their albums, they, they do that. And there's like a, a, a point where it's like, I think it's got to be joy to the world. It's the mm -hmm. only thing I can think of where um, basically instead of saying, uh, you know, praise, praise the king of, of earth and heaven. Yeah. Um, it, it just goes like so, something else vaguely, you know, uh, moralistically <laughs> yeah. happy sounding. Yeah. And mm. it does, like you just hear them and you go, like, oh, oh, those are different lyrics. Oh, right. You're because <laughs> <laughs> you're honest enough to not, not to follow a faith that you don't know. But I, uh, I sort of respect that they're like they're just like coming straight out with it, but I right. don't not, yeah. I don't have to be happy that that's what they're doing, you know. No, right. like, yeah. no. You, you can respect the honesty, but mm -hmm. you can also say, you know, I understand why you don't want to say that. You don't believe it. That's good. Pick a different song. Pick <laughs> a different venue. You don't have to sing Christmas. You don't have to sing mm -hmm. non-Christmas Christmas song. Right. Sing a holiday the, song. The Christmas songs that we have are powerful because of yeah. the truths that they convey. Yeah. Those are powerful truths because we serve a powerful God. Yeah, you don't get to just cut out the parts that make it powerful because you have a philosophical uh, disagreement on 
with what underpins right. that. Well, and know? then they yeah. rewrite it with something, and it's like, okay, this would be powerful if it meant anything at all, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. On the other side, I can recommend, oh, uh, this is, I'm sneaking in a last recommendation here. <laughs> um, two bands that do actual Christmas music in cool ways The Oh Hellos and The Last Bison. Oh, that's right. I forgot about yeah. them for a while. The Last there. Bison is pretty cool. I was recommended them and then I started listening to them uh, over a summer uh, between years of college. And so it was someone who, I didn't know who was pretty much unconnected to the rest of my life who recommended this to me. And I started mm. listening to it and I really loved it. So then I went back to school and I was like, friends, listen to this because it's awesome. And then everybody's like, oh, yeah, they're great. I'm like, why didn't you share this with me? <laughs> but um, The Last Bison especially is kind of like dark Calvinist folk, I guess. <laughs> um, they have I kind have of no the intensity <laughs> of... <laughs> uh, the intensity of metal, but with bluegrass instruments is how okay. I kind of see Ooh. it that's how i how i think of them okay i'm um, now going to write down the words last bison yep and, and then you'll actually, come back to that sticky note later and be like what in the world was yeah, that talking yeah probably you know. <laughs> yeah. but i really i really like their their songwriting not all of their songs make any sense. grammatical or right. other <laughs> kind of sense um but so it's postmodern uh postmodern uh, dark calvinist folk we yeah. keep piling on adjectives it, here. We'll get someplace yeah, close. Yeah, just listen to it. Mm -hmm. Draw your own conclusions, as Peppy you know, says I, in Shopper in the Corner. Similar, I kind of have a similar feeling when it comes to um, the Grey Havens. Mm, the way that yeah. they, like, the way they write their poetic verse is, like, all the pauses end on the end of the line, but the thought goes through to the next line. Mm -hmm. and you're like, that, that doesn't make any sense by itself. The end of that doesn't make any sense as a start to a lot. What is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fun stuff. Anyway, we should wrap up because we are yeah. over time. So thank you guys <laughs> so, so much for this conversation. Uh, it's been a pleasure, um, even though it's a kind of a downer story, but we had fun <laughs> at the end there. Uh, thank you so, mu so much also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Um, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. And us some nice editing software to work with. Helps us out a lot. Um, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. As before mentioned, we don't have a Patreon, but we do have this. So hopefully that's not simony. Um, <laughs> If you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, let us know what you think, um, ask us questions, or tell us what you think we've missed. Um, you can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook, Rumble, YouTube. Thank you so much. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>